Okay, so I'm here in the World Vision International headquarters with Ruthie Hanchett. And Ruthie, what do you do here for World Vision? I work in our policy and advocacy department, International Global Advocacy, and I'm a policy advisor. And I primarily get to work on child rights issues. Okay, and we were just talking about the whole issue of human trafficking, because um, that's something Giving Children Hope's been involved with. And why don't you tell me what World Vision is doing on, around that issue? Yeah, World Vision has a lot of different approaches to um, ending and preventing human trafficking. And a lot of our approaches vary depending on the context and the areas where we're working because we try to respond to the greatest needs in that context and the situation, especially that children are facing. So for instance, my job, I get to work on it on a global level. Um, a lot of what I do is advocacy around raising awareness and trying to influence those global political leaders who have a lot of power to change the situations for children, especially children that might be vulnerable or actually victims of trafficking. But in our field responses, a lot of the countries where we're working, we take a, a much more holistic approach to prevention of trafficking because World Vision works on issues like um, education and poverty reduction, justice, access to social services. Um, a lot of the ways that we're approaching human trafficking is trying to prevent the children that would be most vulnerable from ever being in a situation where they would face a trafficking situation. Um, one of the ways that we work with kids is to raise awareness with the children and especially their parents as well. We've started a lot of um, child advocacy clubs in communities where trafficking is an issue and uh, we try to raise awareness with those kids, teach them things like what to look for, what a trafficker's tricks might be, tempting them with jobs or making them vulnerable. And we also um, try to empower those children to know what their rights are and then speak to their government leaders, um, community leaders, and have a chance to voice their opinions and their ideas and recommendations of ways that they could be better pr protected from trafficking. So we're giving um, the children that have either experienced human trafficking or are vulnerable a chance to raise their voice and tell their leaders and the adults in their community what they need to be better protected. Wonderful. Well, thanks. It sounds like World Vision is doing great work on advocacy for children. Yep. Thank you. Lombatar is the capital, that's where our office is based. It's a massive country with a very small population, about 2.7 million, and it's got a variety of cultures, the majority of which are Mongolians, which have a vast history of, I won't get into, but it's pretty amazing. And a, um, a significant industry in textiles and mining, and much of which the mining is still being discovered, droves of gold and silver and copper that they're trying to figure out what to do with. So it's, um, it's a really it's interesting it. environment. And most notably, though, what blew me away was just the context of this place. It's the coldest capital in the world. The extremes of the climate are unbelievable, from something like minus 60 in the, in the winter to about 110 in the summer. This is the step. This is actually a drive we got to make um, from 180p to another. One of the most durable animals in the world that you'll see in this picture is the camel, the only two hump camels in the world. So this is, um, it's a really tough climate. So when, when the communism ended and the free market economy became into presence in somewhere around 91, 92, World Vision began to do a bit of ministry and relief work. And then uh, just things got very difficult for the people there that used to rely heavily on communist resources. So poverty became a real challenge, access to goods and food, and then the climate extremes and things that came with that. So the, um, they say that about a third of those today there are living on less than 68 cents a day. And many of them are herds people living out across the, the steppe in places, but there's also a large influx to Lombatar, the capital, that are trying to find income as this happens in those poor economies. All of our goal, we need to proclaim the Lordship of Christ. Thirdly, for me, serving the poor is a mark of obedience of following Christ. Now, Christ, uh, you know, in his one of his inaugural messages in Luke's, that we read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, which is called as the Nazarene Manifesto, he would say, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, proclaim freedom to the captives. You know, if you look at it, why didn't Jesus preach good news to the poor? The Spirit of the Lord is
eyes upon me. He has anointed me. Christ's reason to engage with the poor and the oppressed was because he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. That is the reason. If you are anointed by the Holy Spirit, he would drive you to serve the poor. You know, one of the marks of your filling in of the Holy Spirit is do you serve the poor? Is that part of your daily consideration? I believe working with the poor is a very sacred work. You know, it's a very sacred work. And it requires the full armor of God that we read in Ephesians chapter 6. It requires the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, some things are taught, some things are caught. Okay, I can teach accounting, but I can't really teach you honesty. Okay. Honesty is comp. The same way, you know, as we work with the poor, it is the whole life. You know, it's the whole life. You can't separate life from the programs. You know, they all they all go hand in hand. I've seen communities in Cambodia. Uh, I can keep telling stories, but my time is coming to an end, so I need to keep that in mind. Um, some of the biggest changes happen because people, my staff had a very close relationship in working with the Lord. The community did not see them as the staff of a multi-million dollar agency. They saw them as the servants of God. You know, that's very important. Funding can produce programs. <laughs> you know, uh, budget can produce activities. Technology can produce interventions, but only a life can produce a life. Hmm. Only a disciple can produce a life. You know, I think, uh, you know, I've, again, you know, I'm just, I'm going to refrain from telling stories. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does it mean? Prayer and the study of scriptures become essential development tools. You know? <laughs> few more points and I will stop. Our commitment to empowerment is not because it's a good development theory. I believe our commitment to empowerment comes from our Christian notion, our Christian understanding of the dignity God bestows on his people. That's fundamental. God, the only creation to which God let this image of the human beings. Human beings are the crown of his creation. Every person is valued enough to be said of God that Christ died for them. So when I see a poor, do I see the image of God in that person? You know, being created in the image of God means being created in the created image of God. People have the ability to create. That's part of being created in the image of God. So my fundamental belief, even in the most catastrophic situation, people have something to contribute. Okay? It might be a street child living, uh, living on the street, not being a school. That child has something essential to contribute. Okay, so my commitment to empowerment comes from how I read the scripture, how I read the Bible. Finally, we have a kingdom bias in working with children. This is a deliberate bias. You know, working with children, contributing the well-being of children, this developmentally makes a lot of sense. But I don't want to dwell on that this morning. We have a deliberate choice in terms of working with children. Working with children is a reflection of the heart of God. In welcoming the child, <laughs> We welcome the Father and challenge those who passionately pursue the dream of being the greatest. You know, to, uh, to a bunch of adults, his disciples, who, uh, who had this power issue, who is the greatest, Christ had a simple answer. That answer was, child. And you know, God's response to this power-centric world was, you know, one of my favorite songs is Psalm 8. Thou hast 
has ordained praise from the mouths of infants and babes to avenge the poor. You know, I think it's, it's a spiritual issue for us to work with children, for us to focus on children, to, to work alongside children. Those are some, some of my key beliefs as to how I understand transformation development. That's what I want to leave you closing. You know, I, you know, this morning I woke up and I prayed and all that, and I had lots of few stories, but I'm not going to share any of them. But I want to share with you one few practice. This field practice comes from Africa in Kenya, 180p, where they decided to focus intentionally include the most vulnerable children. And how that translated into a movement.